All right, good morning, traders. My name is Christopher Vecchio, Senior Currency Strategist with Daily FX. Today is Tuesday, May 9th, 2017. I'm here today joined by my colleagues Nick Colley and Oliver Morrison. Good morning, guys. Good morning, all. Good morning. We're here today to take you through this week's European Desk Roundtable where we'll discuss pertinent events coming out of Europe and how they're impacting FX markets. As always, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to put them in the chat box at any point in time. If you're looking for trade-specific insight, please share with us your entry stop and time frame so we know where you've gotten into the market, where your risk lies, and of course what your point of view is. Beyond that, please be aware that any opinion I disseminate is, or rather any opinion that we disseminate is hours and hours alone does not constitute trade advice on behalf of Daily Effects or IG Group, so please don't treat it as such. Um, of course, when we talk about Europe right now, guys, I think the number one thing we have to talk about is what's going on with the Euro post-French elections. Euro dollar opened up the week above 110 on the news that Emmanuel Macron would become the next president of France, defeating right-wing populist Marine Le Pen. Uh, at this point in time, though, the euro is trading some 105 pips lower than where we were when we started the week. Uh, Nick, I'm going to throw it to you first. Do you think this is a surprise, or do you think that markets had just correctly discounted the results of Sunday's election ahead of time? Uh, yeah, good point. Um, I think everything had been basically priced in last week into the euro. Um, I, I, mean, I think we've been having discussions before that uh, the French polls have always have been very accurate coming up into this run in uh, in the first round and uh, and coming into the second round. Uh, they were very accurate, and it was pretty much uh, settled that Le Pen wasn't going to get in. Um, I think the, the move that we actually saw, the main move that we really saw on on, on the euro, was really the one before. The, sorry, at the end of the first round when Macron got through, and we saw the euro jump then. Um, I think looking at where we are now, um, yeah, it, it has been discounted. I mean, you've got the ECB meeting coming up. Um, there's not expected to be any change. You know, we've still got ongoing quantitative easing. We've still got lower rates, uh, for perhaps even longer. The, the risk, the bounce has gone. Um, there's a there's a gap in you know, on, on the technical side. There's a gap in the market, uh, which looks like it may be needed to fill on the downside. Um, so yeah, I, I think everything's pretty much done and dusted in the short term for the euro. Anyhow. Yeah, I I, I agree with I agree with Nick that um, the 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 result of the French election was really really priced in sort of two weeks ago after that strong showing from Macron in the first round. And now euro dollar is actually um, dipping again today, and I think that one one hundred eight fifty is the is a really important kind of line in the sand at, at the close of trading today, and that will that will really tell us if if the euro if euro dollar will stay in that slightly higher range, or if it will eventually if it is if it is on its way back towards that slightly lower one one hundred five range. Right, and I actually want to. Uh... You know something a little fun here about the French election results. Um, the actual French election results were further away from the polls than either Brexit or the U.S. presidential election. Um, that's something of interest to me, where pollsters were just too pessimistic on Macron's chances of winning. Actually, he outperformed them by about 10 percent, whereas uh, both Brexit and the U.S. presidential election fell within the polling margins of error. So I found that to be very interesting. This time the polls, you know, of course, everyone's praising them, uh, myself included, and yet they were more wrong than the two times that most of the general public has said, you pollsters have no idea what the heck you're doing. Um, and, you know, Oliver, I agree with you completely there. 108.50 to me is going to be a pretty significant zone in the euro coming up. Um, something that we were discussing yesterday morning was that we kind of have this band of support resistance that's been in play going back to last February between 108 and 108.50. And although we have a gap fill that might be created to at some point in the future, and that of course would be the closing period from Friday, April 21st, right before the first round of the elections at 107.25, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that you know we can only talk about a gap fill if we do start to slice down through some of these longer term uh, levels of, of support resistance here. I, I guess my question is though, euro dollar is of interest, but uh, euro pound, you know, to me is perhaps the most tantalizing setup there is in the FX market right now if it comes to fruition. Uh, this head and shoulders pattern, of course, wouldn't be valid unless we see the neckline break, and the neckline is 
hanging out right around 83. So we've had a ton of false starts to the downside this year. No real fall through just yet. Um, you know, Oliver, do you think that the upcoming UK elections on June 8th could be the catalyst to push euro pound lower, or is that something that's you know really not going to affect the pair, the pound really in any meaningful way? I, I suspect it won't affect that that pair in the longer term because in, in the same way the French election was priced in uh, at the first round, I, um, a lot of it maybe I, th I think that the victory for the ruling Conservative Party is already, is already priced in. I think I um, I'm pretty bearish on euro pound, uh, and I think um, we'll get some movements a, a long time before the actual result of, of the election. For, for example, there's some there's some important um, industrial production data out of the UK uh, later this week, and that that could put more pressure on on that pair, especially as um, the the French election result was actually seen as being negative for Theresa May and her and her Brexit stance, but that really hasn't been shown. That has that's had very little impact on the the, the pound euro exchange rate, if at all. Um, which which suggests there's probably a lot a lot of a lot of strength there, and it is quite a bearish pair. I think that's an interesting point that you bring up because the polls for the UK election have been fairly one-sided. Um, in fact, if you look at some of the polling figures that were just released yesterday, the Labour Party could get less of the popular vote than the National Front did in France during the recent elections. I think Labour's polling at 28% and National Front got 35% or thereabouts, 34.5%. Um, I think that's pretty astounding right now. Um, to your point, though, and I think, Nick, this is something you should address. Do you think that having someone who is as staunchly pro-EU at the head of France, at the head of the EU's second most important economy, will do anything to change the course of the Brexit negotiations? I know we have an important milestone this week when EU ambassadors meet to discuss Brexit. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't, I, I don't think so. I mean, you know, Macron here is this sort of thirty-eight, thirty-nine year old. He's become the youngest president of France. You know, younger than Napoleon. Of, yeah, something. I mean, first and foremost, he's got to elect a new president, which I think he needs to do by uh, or around May the fifteenth. Prime then Minister, got, just the chairman. Yes, Prime, Prime Minister, apologies. And then you've got the, you know, then you've got the uh, upcoming five hundred and seventy-seven sort of parliamentary constitution constituencies are up for grabs it's a new party he's got nothing to build on now he's, he's got enough problems of his I think Macron's got enough problems of his own in the short term anyhow um, to start being distracted by being some kind of um, pro-EU figurehead you know there's enough of those anyhow in the EU I think for Macron he really needs to sort of he needs to get his new prime minister out hopefully a long-term prime minister for him he needs to see how he does in, in the upcoming elections in June. He needs to build, as I said, from a base of zero. And so it's, I think he really must concentrate on that. And as I said, the EU, the EU, there's enough people talking about the EU. There's enough people having a go about Brexit. I, I think at the moment he really needs to sort of concentrate on um, domestic matters more than anything else. Macron has a really hard job in his hands now in finding all the candidates his party needs all those legislative elections. Currently, his party, which is a really new movement, has zero um, showing in that legislature. But um, and there, there was news today that Manuel Valls, who is a former French prime minister, wants to join um, Macron's party. And I, I think it really fuels that argument that the Macron win does signal um, con continuity and continuity of, of, of the European project. And I think um, for the markets, that, that means that, that that French threat is just is done and dusted. And we're now looking towards the next political threat in the EU, which is the German election in, in September, and also that, that lingering debt crisis. 
If I may disagree there, actually, I think the next lingering threat for Europe is not the German elections, only because if Merkel wins, then you see more of the same. If Schultz wins, then you probably have someone who's a little more pro-EU and open to fiscal integration. Um, but rather, I think the big thing that people need to watch out for moving forward once we get through this you know, next round of elections in early June, we have the UK snap elections June 8th, and then the French legislative elections June 11th and 18th. Um, I think Italy could go to elections at some point this year, and uh, there's something to be said about that M Star Five party there now, are lining up with the Lega Nord, where they, the two of them might have enough constituents to gain power as a coalition. Um, Italy is Europe's third largest economy, and right now, if you take a look at the European banking sector, Italy has about roughly 19%. Of its uh, or, or the loans held by its bank, about 19% of those loans are non-performing loans. They're not going to collect any interest back or principal on them. They're just simply terrible, toxic assets. Um, Liga Nord and M Star Five Party has said that they're going to take Italy out of the EU and they're going to start nationalizing some of these banks. So I, I think if there is a risk that people need to be aware of, that you know traders may not want to get too bullish the euro on, it's this fact that we could see. Italy's election go upside down, uh, and, and we'll lose a centrist like Padwan or you know even a Renzi, and it's possible that Renzi comes back into politics at this point in time. Um, but kind of looking you know big picture here for the EU, do you think that this populist wave that has kind of afflicted the markets the last year plus has settled down? Has it crested, or are we merely just kicking the can down the road? Could someone like Le Pen become president in 2022, for example? I mean, that's a possibility. Um, I, I think if you look at the, the voting results and the French election, a lot of people voted for Macron to vote against Le Pen. It was sort of negative voting. Uh, so, it, it, which in some ways it showed the sort of the, 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 the feeling over in France, but. You know, you've seen this in you've seen that the sort of the rise of the right wing, unfortunately, over in Austria. You've seen it over in um, the Netherlands. Uh, you've got it coming through in uh, France, uh, the UK. I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's just basically people that are are just tired of what's been happening. You know, this they see the gap between the rich and the poor widening. Uh, you know, there's, 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 there's so many things on a social level that people are looking at and they're just uh, 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 just saying enough. And sometimes, you know, we talk about disruptors when you look at industries and stuff like that, but some of these parties are disruptors more than anything else. You know, it's, it is a vote for change more than a vote for some of these parties' policies. I, I completely, and I think what, what backs up your point there as well is, is the massive um, number of people who didn't vote in, in the French election. That, that really was very high historically, which re really goes to show that the people, a lot of people voting for Macron were, trying to, were just trying to keep out Le Pen, and he, he couldn't really garner that level of support that he, he, he did anticipate, which does show there's still, a, there's still a large number of people in that French election who, who didn't want to vote for that continuity candidate. And I think Another thing that will really illustrate that the strength of that populist movement in Europe will actually be the UK election, and strangely enough, the, the showing for the UK Labour Party, which really, a lot of people may disagree with this, but I think it really has, it's, all, it's almost become uh, a, a populist party, but of the left wing, not, not of the right wing, and it's almost becoming um, a disruptor party, a, 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 protest group and although Corbyn has such a bad showing uh, in, the, in the current polls, I think um, currently Theresa May is, is as strong as the fact she was in the 80s in, in the polls, but he's really saying, look, the polls are saying that, but the polls also said I had no chance of becoming Labour leader and I became Labour leader twice. And he's, he's really making a strong case for Getting young people, young people out who are who have not really voted before. He want, he wants them to vote, and he's saying there may be this big unheard of group that may come out and vote for me and surprise 
polls. Yeah, I saw some interesting stats on that. Uh, with respect to the French elections, the turnout was lowest since 1969. So there's something to be said about people looking at both candidates and being really unhappy. I mean, I think it says a lot that you know the the left wing candidate, if you will, in the French election uh, was an ex banker, <laughs> um, right? Typically, the people on the left aren't too keen about bankers, and yet they fully embrace Macron uh, when when they were faced with the choice of Le Pen or anyone else. Um, moreover, if, and now switching to UK elections, if the Labour Party were to get 30% more turnout from people under the age of 30, holding everything else constant, uh, Labour would win the majority in Parliament, which I thought was an interesting uh, statistic to play because you see across a lot of these demographics that the parties that are in power right now have been put into power by generally speaking older voters and now that we're seeing you know in Europe at least we have this Erasmus generation coming of age Erasmus being the program where you know if you're a student in France you can study abroad uh, uh, during a university term in say Germany for a year to experience other cultures in Europe um, you see that this Erasmus generation of younger people is starting to come to, to age of now get, getting into politics and so you know, I'm partial to think that if Labour doesn't come to pow power now, then it's possible the next elections that we have in the UK result in a Labour victory and maybe seeing someone like Corbyn come to power. But I got to say, I, my view from, you know, my side of the pond at least, and I have a totally different, different experience with UK politics than both of you gents, um, is just that this is a very coy power grab by Theresa May. Labour is historically unpopular, according to polls, and uh, the Tories are kind of left as the only sensible group of people in town and so you know why not have a general election when Theresa well, May can expand her parliamentary majority from 17 seats to 17 or 70 seats or something like that um, you know Oliver touched on it before but I think it's worth bringing up again these elections are on June 8th you know Nick do you think that the move in the pound has more or less been priced in at this point in time um, well, the pre, pre-election move, I, I think there's still more to go. Um, I think you really need to, on, on the pound especially, I think this, this week's a big week for the pound and, and it's Thursday, Super Thursday, Bank of England, uh, MPC, all unchanged. But the, the one to be looking out for is the, um, the quarterly inflation report. Um, you get this feeling that if uh, Mark Carney, uh, he can do he can do two things, or he can do three things, but he can do different options. He can upgrade inflation, he can upgrade back uh, growth. Both of those would have an impact on the pound. Um, or he can say, no, we're we're okay. We're going to keep our uh, forecasts from February pretty much unchanged. Looking at the pound, I think it's got more to go. I think that um, we could. I mean, you've got this chart up here, which looks reasonably. And, and I can I can see 132 coming up. Um, I haven't looked at the technicals again for some time, but I can I can quite happily see 132 come up. And and why not go for that you know that 134 and change target that you're getting there. Um, and I think that a, a, a positive showing from the Bank of England, um, maybe Mark Carney saying that he is aware of inflation risks at the over overshoot in inflation. Um, may just get uh, may just get the uh, pound pushing higher a little bit further. Right. So just, to just clarify, to... the Bank of England's QIR that's coming up this Thursday is equivalent to the SEPs that the ECB and the Federal Reserve put out every few that's months. That's right. Yeah. That's um, right. It's, it's, it's they're updated. It's effectively, they're updated. The Bank of England or the NPC's updated prediction, uh, quarterly updated predictions, where the market is, where they think it's going for this year, next year, and the year afterwards. Right, and like the ECB and the and the Fed, sorry, Oliver, um, we see that the BOE really hasn't made a significant decision at meetings in which they haven't had a QIR. So like the Fed and the ECB with their SEPs and the RBNZ with their monetary policy report, the BOE kind of likes to be predictable. And so unless they have justification in hand, they don't really do anything. So this is one of those few times a year that the window is just opened up a little bit of you know, just a little bit here. Um, Oliver, you were saying? I just wanted to say I, I, I agree with Nick that the, the pound really has some, still, have some, still has some room to maneuver uh, upwards. 
uh, that technically that that 130 area is is proving a bit difficult to, to, to breach, and if it does, it's got it really could it's got some lo lots of room to to rally higher. But the, I think the important thing to remember about the um the bo uh, the Bank of England this week is that um yeah they're, they're not expected to move in because of the uh, the election period, but remember that the, the the two things that led them to start this discussing um, hawkish things at the last meetings, have, have, they've now disappeared because um, com commodity prices have dropped and um, retail sales, according to the, uh, the latest um, BRC figures this morning, that they're, they're, they're rising again. So, so the, the two concerns that they, they had last time have been, been sort of taken out of the equation because of, of that. Yeah, and, and also you can you can add into that that you know with the pound um, gently appreciating over the last few months, must have appreciated three, three, four plus percent against the euro and and the and the dollar. That also will take out the sort of imported a little bit of the imported inflation. All right, I'm just looking at some of the numbers here with respect to what you guys were saying. And, and yeah, you know, the, the Kirsten Forbes dissent at the last BOE meeting, um, to me, seems like it's going to be an isolated or short-lived incident only because Kirsten Forbes is leaving. She, she leaves soon, yeah, exactly. So, uh, actually, actually, also remember that this month there's only, um, there's not the normal nine voting MPC members, there's only eight because, because Charlotte, uh, Charlotte gone. Has, has gone, yeah. So it'll be right. a, probably a 7-1 vote this time. Yeah, interesting that she forgot to disclose that her brother was a banker at Barclays. <laughs> Curious how she forgot about that. Uh, you know, some of these people. Blows my mind. Uh, like Mario Draghi's son is an interest rate trader. How is that allowed? <laughs> um, in any case, I digress. Uh, when we're talking about, uh, you know, the, the general overall big picture here, because these risks seemingly have subsided, do we think that perhaps the best way to play the pound or the euro isn't necessarily versus the dollar? Um, you know, if Nick, do you have a preferred pair? If you say if you're long the euro or long the pound, where are you looking for that right now? Um, I would probably point towards uh, sterling yen or euro yen. I think what you need to look at is uh, you, you need to try and find somewhere where, where the, the macro side, uh, uh, you know, uh, economic side, is, is pretty much the same. So in, in Japan, we've still got ongoing QE. We've got this commitment to cheap money, flat to negative rates. You know, they're going to buy as many 10-year bonds as they can that down at or around 0%. So, you, you, again, you've got massive liquidity there. So you've got this liquidity, which is going to undermine the Japanese yen. Uh, the pound, we are, we are, we kind of, we finished QE apart from the end, a little bit of corporate bond buying, but you know we still got cheap money coming around. So you can compare those two economies, just about with with the pound perhaps being slightly stronger than the yen. And I think the same goes for the for the euro versus the yen. Although in the euro's case, you do still have this ongoing QE, and the potential for further QE at the end of next year. So if if I'm looking to go Long the pound, I'd go long the pound versus the yen. And you could even, you could even go look at something like pound, pound Swissy even because um, we we are we are looking at higher risk appetite. The VIX has closed at its lowest level yesterday since since 1993, so the safe havens are suffering. That so that includes the yen and the Swissy. Um, the dollar Swissy is is uh, back at parity, so. Yeah, a, a lot of you again. If you if you're looking at pairs that really might illustrate um, the pound strength, you could you could include you could include pound Swissy there. If there's a pair that I'm going to throw out there for everyone, I, I still think that playing the pound in the euro versus these commodity currencies is probably the way to go. Um, commodity currencies, Australian dollar in particular, have been absolutely smoked the last few weeks thanks to this decline in iron ore and copper prices. Um, right now, Pound Aussie is continuing to run up towards the base of this triangle that we've been working our way through, bottoming here mm -hmm. for the past several weeks. Uh, I would be eyeing a move, a continue to eye a move up towards 
177.60 or so, the swing highs that we had back in July and September 2016. Likewise, if you're talking about commodity prices, how can you ignore what's been going on with oil the last, you know, few weeks too? Since April 12th, prices have declined from a high of 53.74, and here we are at 46.55. Euro CAD to me is perhaps an interesting look, even though as the euro pulls back here, um, we've seen that a bottom has been put into place the early part of this year, and momentum has been fairly strong to the top side. I guess the big point I want to pivot to and kind of end on is oil prices have come off quite significantly and on a year-over-year -year basis now they're not really the tailwind that they've been to inflation that they once were. Um, you know we go out a year ago and we close that day at $43.23. Here we are trading at forty six fifty eight, and so we're talking about a market that's somewhere in the neighborhood of what only seven percent higher um, than it was this time last year that to me is a big departure from what we saw just two or three months ago back at the beginning of March oil was trading above fifty two dollars a barrel when a year ago it was trading around twenty six or twenty seven so I think when you talk about inflation and how that's been perhaps poking the ECB maybe to move away from their lower bound or perhaps you know will the BOE be forced to raise rates We've seen some dissent there from someone like Kirsten Forbes, but again, she's leaving. And the Federal Reserve seems to be on the war path to raising rates, irrespective of how the U.S. economy performs. It looks like inflationary pressures could be starting to come off a little bit now that we're moving into the middle part of 2017. Um, just to briefly touch on what's going on with the U.S. economy, because we've been talking about euro dollar and pound dollar, and all those have the dollar part of the equation. You know, I have my own opinion, certainly, being an American being over here on this side of the pond, but you know, as, as two foreigners who are watching um, headlines come out of the United States, do you have any opinions on the state of where you think U.S. fiscal policy may be going? What I mean is, do you think that recent developments would cater to this belief that we're going to see fiscal stimulus out of the United States soon, or is that something that perhaps people are still too excited about? Um, yeah, okay. Um... Lots of, from from this side of the pond. Um, lots of noise. The first hundred day of the, the U.S. President Donald Trump. Not really a great deal has happened. Uh, you know, the first hundred days is meant to be the time when you're, you're most popular and you can get things done with uh, with, e with or easier than than, than other times. Um, I'm really it, it's it's. You know, we're going to have high rates. It looks like we're going to have a, a, a rate increase in June, uh, and then possibly to probably one more, or probably one more before the end of um, end of the year. But on on the fiscal side, you know, if you look at the stock markets, they absolutely flew. They went up 10, 11, 12 percent uh, on the back of this massive supposed one trillion fiscal spend uh, uh, and tax cuts and, and, and such but again we really we I think we really need to see it you know we really need to see it happening uh, there's, there's too much buying ahead of uh, it seems to me too much buying ahead of the uh, of any actions going on Uh, Oliver, what are your thoughts on uh, what's going on out of the U.S.? Do you think that Donald Trump is full of bluster, or do you think he's going to be able to deliver on some of these health care and tax reform that have seemingly uh, been lifting up U.S. markets? I, I, I think Donald Trump is, is definitely full of, of bluster. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, sl I'm slightly worried that um, uh, he, he's not, he, his, his kind of head isn't in tune with, with what his mouth is saying and what and what he's tweeting at times but i i've, I've yeah I'm, I'm afraid i've i've been completely bogged down in um european elections and and british elections i think I, yeah i think you could tell us about what's happening in the us i think just on, on one thing that i think over here as well i mean donald trump has been it depends on your definition of success, a successful businessman for all of his life you know he's got things done he can walk in he can he can push through he can uh, Bully for the want of a better word, he can get things done. He now comes into government and he's trying to use it. Seems 
to me anyhow. He's now coming into government. He's trying to use this same kind of bluster and, and walk through anything uh, kind of attitude, and it's not working. And he, he's got to realize it can't work. You know, you cannot run a democracy like that with one person just walking through as if, you know, it's his own company. So I think he's got a lot of problems coming up. I was slightly, I was slightly worried by his comments the other week where he said that um, being president was harder work than he thought it was going to be. Yeah, I mean, if you ever look at pictures of presidents before and after their term in office, generally speaking, a good rule of thumb is they're going to look terrible after their four or eight years in office. Uh, president Obama looked like he aged two or three decades while he was sim simply president. Um, you know, same thing with George Bush and Bill Clinton, the recent presidents we've had of the United States. These guys just look awful after they, they leave their term. You'd think that that's a pretty fair indication that what they're doing is stressful, if you will. Um, I digress. I think, you know, the number one thing to be concerned about for the Fed and the dollar ultimately is if there is no delivery on these fiscal promises. The feedback mechanism is, of course, higher government spending, lower taxes, you get bigger deficits. Larger deficits tend to lead to inflationary pressures. If you have inflationary pressures building, then you have a reason for the Fed to go ahead and raise rates sooner than expected. I saw that pretty interesting pricing yesterday. Rates markets now have a June rate hike penciled in as a 100% chance. Um, I think there may be a little bit of pull now on the back end of rate hike expectations to kind of realign the market with what the Federal Reserve is seeing. The Federal Reserve has made pretty clear, from my point of view at least, given recent policy statements and minutes of Fed meetings, that they intend to hike rates at least two more times this year and then go ahead and announce a balance sheet normalization process. Right now what they're doing is they're taking the proceeds of principal from their asset investments and they're buying up, soaking up mortgage-backed securities from the financial sector, which in turn is effectively stimulus for longer term rates. Mortgage-backed securities are tied to mortgages, of course. Mortgages are based on 15 and 30 year debt. And so by the Fed being willing to absorb all these MBS from the banking system, they're effectively pushing down long end rates. So if the Fed is going to continue to be headstrong and ignore some of this first quarter data that we had out of the US, I'm inclined to think that the market, which is only pricing in a June rate hike right now, and then there is no other month, the rest of 2017 right now, with implied probability above 60% for a rate hike, which for those that have come here before know that I think that's the line in the sand that you got to look to for Fed rate hikes. They've hiked rates several times when it's been below 60, but they've also not hiked rates several times when it's been about like 53 or 54% over the last 20 plus years. So I think having a threshold there of confidence is important and every time above 60% for the front month contract, um, they have gone ahead and hiked. So the fact that we only see one month above 60 for this year and it's June tells me that the market isn't fully on board yet with the second rate hike, and they certainly don't have priced in a balance sheet normalization process. So, you know, if the Fed continues to say, no, no, we're going to hike rates twice more, go ahead with balance sheet normalization, the market's got to play a little bit of catch up. And if that's the case, then it has underpriced, I would say, a steeper yield curve for the greenback, which could be a bona fide bullish catalyst. Yeah, I was, going to, I was just going to say, if, if you look at the two-year Treasury, we're, we're, we're what, about 1.33, 1.335. We're back to levels sort of March 2008 uh, on, on the yield-wise. So, yeah, as you see, we're just about to come back above there. So, I, I think the two-year is telling you, I think the two-year is telling you, you've got another two heights coming in this year. Uh, about the bond normalization, not so sure. Um, if you look at the 10-year and the 30-year U.S. Treasury, they're only really trading back at levels um, seen recently, sort of 2.4 and to the tens and uh, three and a bit, um, and those are only really back to sort of early mid-March levels. So, I, I, but I do think that the, the, the two-year is pointing you to probably two rate hikes, two additional rate hikes this year. Yeah, and the flattening out of the yield curve is something that people should be aware of as well. Flattening yeah. yield curve when short-term yields rise and approach the level of longer-term yields. Um, and we see the difference between, say, the 10 and the 2 or the 30 and the 5 decrease. Generally speaking, you're, it's, it's not usually a good signal about the economy. Of course, you can make the argument that, look, uh, you know, we're going into a state where uh, both 
fiscal and monetary policy is restrictive, which technically it still is, the U.S. hasn't made any fiscal changes, then the yield curve is likely to flatten. Um, you're probably going to see lower economic growth in the future. On the other hand, the fact that the Fed is making a very strong signal to the market depends on raising rates, uh, and, and we've seen that these longer-term yields not really perk up as they may should, uh, may lead some to believe that perhaps we're not actually going to see a follow-through on some of those fiscal stimulus promises from the Trump administration. Um, I digress, though. That is a conversation for another week here, as we have run the course of this about 40-minute session. I want to thank my colleagues Nick Colley and Oliver Morrison for coming out this morning and discussing French elections, UK elections, and everything in between over the past few weeks. We'll be back in the next week or so to talk more once again on these very issues. Uh, hopefully we'll have some further developments along the polling front for the UK elections coming up and we'll of course keep an eye tuned towards the French legislative elections because Emmanuel Macron could be a fairly weak president from day one if he doesn't get a French assembly behind him. That's one to implement his quite radically centrist reforms. Um, with that said, if you have any comments or questions, you can always reach out to us through the Daily FX Real Time News Feeds, Stock Notes, and Twitter. You can access that by heading up to the news banner on the top of the website and clicking on Real Time News. My tweets, Nick Oliver's, as well as the rest of the Daily FX's team, will appear in there in real time as well as analysis and trade ideas. Likewise, if you have any other comments or questions, you can email us, cvecchio at dailyfx.com, nick.colley at ig.com, and oliver.morrison at ig.com. If I don't speak to you before then, good luck trading not only the rest of this week, but for the foreseeable future. Cheers. Cheers.